Good evening, Hopkinton, and welcome to the Hopkinton Hangout Hour. Um, it is Wednesday, and I am your host tonight with our co-host, Bob Hamilton. And tonight, we're um, very pleased to welcome Sean McAuliffe yet again um, from the Board of Health, who is going to chat with us all things coronavirus and coronavirus vaccine. A lot of things happening, a lot of things changing. And uh, at this time, I think it's really nice to be able to talk about what the future may hold for us. So, Bob, Sean, welcome. Welcome to the Hangout Hour. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jim. Okay. All right. So, Sean, before we get to the vaccine, we want to like hold that back a bit because everybody's all excited about that. Let's talk about the, uh, the current state. Um, it was very concerning after Thanksgiving and after Christmas where a lot of people were traveling for the holidays and all over the place and we're seeing another surge. Uh, what's the current state of our we're, cases? So we're, we're, we're in the, you know, a second, a second holiday surge. Um, you know, I pulled the travel records last week. Uh, we had, I think over 500 and no, it was 635 people traveled between Thanksgiving and New Year's. Um, and what we thought would see was a, a slight surge in youth getting sick. Um, so, you know, it's not that my in-laws want to see me for the holidays. They want to see my kids. So you had, you know, the kids would interact more with people outside of the pod and um, they were contracting illness and it's, it's transitioning to adults and other family members right now getting ill. So, um, you know, we've seen um, what today we're, it's changing, you know, hourly, but we're up to 508 cases. Um, so we've had um, over 300 and what have we had? We've had over 368 cases since September 21st, um, mm. and um, and we've got about 74 active. Uh, but again, it's it, it. What we're seeing is the majority of the cases are in like they're contained in you know the families. So it's someone went out and you know they contracted it at work. They went to a gathering. Um, they came back from college, or they had an, uh, or from sports, brought into the family, and we've seen, you know, one case blossom into two, three, or four. Um, so when you multiply that by 10, 20 families, you know, you can start to understand why, you know, we've seen our numbers continue to uh, um, increase. Um, yeah. On a positive note: we're still doing better than the majority of the communities in the area. Um, the only thing that is slightly concerning is, you know, our positivity rate in town is at 432, which is, um, that's the highest it's been. Um, it, it might be the highest it's been. Um, and, um, and then when you start looking around us, you know, there are positivity rates at 7.6, 6.2, 8.8, 4.9 and then you know Southboro and Westboro were doing you know a little better at 3.59 and 4.2 so you know what we're trying to communicate to people is that there's a lot of risk out there and you want to you want to right now at least for the next couple of weeks just kind of hunker down and like reduce your exposure and um, if we do that I'm convinced that we're going to drop um our positivity back down and we'll be in a better place. Now, so what 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 is our four point something? 4.32. Did I hear just recently, like a day or two ago, that the state's positivity rate was somewhere around 8%? Yeah, it's up there. It's I think the last figure I saw was around seven six. But um, you know, honestly, it's been tough just trying to get to just trying to watch the news. You know, I used yeah. to joke that I didn't watch anything but, you know, the Disney Channel. Um, and then I'd, I'd splurge on watching the news a bit. And it's just been tough to uh, um, 
watch much much of anything right now because of uh you know the just case management we're doing mm-hmm. a lot better there yeah um, and and having you know having four per diem people assisting us is yeah. really helping casey and i but you know what i was explaining today is now we have an entirely new job putting together you know a mass vaccination program <laughs> for the town you know which is you know it's 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 really a piece of cake <laughs> coordinating <laughs> you know yeah. a pandemic response <laughs> right right so, uh, so i'm curious i'm curious what do you think is the reason for the disparity between the statewide average of close to 8% and Hopkinton's um, current rate of just over 4%? Is it the McAuliffe effect? Is it the difference between a more rural community versus a um, city or something like that? I, I think it's, it, it's because, you know, I, I like to think that, you know, Casey and I, and the, and the, you know, our, you know, the municipality got on it a little faster and we started getting the message out and just talking and engaging the, you know, the residents of Hopkinton. And, and it's that little edge. It's, it's the attention. It's the fact that we try to touch base with every resident um, so that they know what to do. Um, they get information on quarantining and isolation and, they have their release dates. Um, and, and then, you know, unlike some of the, some of the larger communities around us, you know, we, we have, for the most part, single family homes. Um, the larger residential communities we have are, for the most part, on top of things. And they're, they're restricting access to, you know, workout rooms and the pools and the fire pits and stuff like that. So we, we've done a good job working with our partners in the community. And, um, and that's really what it takes. It's, um, it's just, you know, if you, if you cut, you know, a couple cases off, you know, those cases could have, you know, they could lead to 15, 20 more. And and it's just, you know, we've just been, um, I think maybe a little more aggressive. Um, And, um, and then we don't have some of the challenges with, you know, I, I was talking to Framingham, you know, several times a week coming into um, December and and just, you know, having to go out and get, um, um, you know, interpreter or interpretive services to do your uh, trace back. Um, yep. Working through some of the, um, just some of the, you know, the issues and, and some of the barriers and just issues and just, you know, having to learn how a community works and, you know, just how they operate and communicate. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's foolish to believe that, you know, I can put my, my beliefs and, you know, my, my, what my personal understanding is onto another community that, you know, ha- you know, that is a whole set of different experiences. And, and that's, these are the little intricacies that we, you know, we we have to address with all of these uh just with all of this so um right yeah and then i mean like i said we've done you know there there are several small cities that are you know been following our lead with our communication and um so i think Mm -hmm. that all is added up to put us in a better position Mm -hmm. and now it's just um you know like my focus if i if i control it in the school we're going to be in a better position. You know, we still don't have, we don't have any student to student, student to teacher or teacher to student spread yeah. in the school. I think we're, you know, I don't want to jinx ourselves. So I'm not going to wood, but <laughs> we're one of the few communities that um, doesn't have that. And, um, and so it's just, it's the whole, this whole package that is gone right. into getting us, and, and people, you know, people listen. They're not combative. They're like, yeah. And I credit the residents of Hopkinton for 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 taking time and listening to us and having those conversations and picking up the phone. Um, yeah. 
So you briefly mentioned as you were as you were talking that Hopkinton is one of the few. There are some school systems that haven't had uh, spread from student to student or student to teacher. Um, can you expand upon that a little bit? Because I don't really have any any knowledge about that. I'm curious. I know there was a great concern. Remember in August, what in the world was going to happen when the schools got in session? And I just from my perch in in the high school, things have been going really well. And I'm curious how um, how abnormal in a, you know what I mean uh, is that for what the rest of our, our communities have been experiencing. I mean, so Dr. Kavanaugh, Tim Persons, um, Susan Rothamack, they put together a good plan. They, they assessed their facilities. Um, they, they made modifications to improve um, the, you know, the HVAC system, the filtration. Then, you know, they started attacking um, how are they going to set the classrooms? And then I think what we've demonstrated is, you know, proper distancing in the classroom with a lot of attention to um, face coverings and hygiene has worked. Um, and, and then, and just people, you know, and everybody got used to operating within that. They got used to, you know, when they go into the cafeteria to get the squirt of sanitizer before they sit down to eat. And, and we've got a good routine. And I think that's, that's gone a long way um, into you know, curbing our spread or, or just preventing spread. And then it's also the fact that you know, we, were, we were aggressive with the way that we handled our cases and um, we've adapted and we've, we've adapted well to the changes in the guidance. And, um, and then, you know, attestation is, you know, it, it's working. We've been, we've prevented, God, we've prevented several cases from getting into the school. Each week, it's one or two that we're seeing that we pre uh, prevented from getting in. And, uh -huh. and it's just, it's all of these little things coming together to get us there. And, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out, do we want us, do we want to consider pool sampling? Um, and then just what are the other things we can do to, you know, to prevent, again, prevent spread, to improve education. You know, I think one of the big things is when we, um, when we vaccinate the, uh, the teachers and the staff, that's going to go a long way to helping uh, to curb, um, you know, curb activity in the schools. Uh, right. Now, there was a lot of, as we know, we've already mentioned it, consternation over the holidays and people being cooped up and just wanting to see their friends and family. We're almost three weeks out from Christmas now. Do you think that we have seen what we're going to see, or do you think it could still be a plateau or build a little bit from here? I think we're we're I think we're coming out of it, but we're still seeing. You know, today was uh, people coming back from a ski trip, um, people coming back from a vacation. So I had three different travel-related cases today alone. Um, and um, and then I've, I had a, a a senior come in contact with someone um, ill over the holiday, over New Year's. So we're we're still seeing a few of those, um, but I, I think you know you know knock on wood we're we're moving in the right direction. I think our um, we're going to be flirting with that red risk rating again because we had. We had like 30, 36, 38 cases last week. Um, we're in the high 20s right now. So what we're better, we were better than last week. And um, and I'm, I'm just, I'm optimistic. I don't want to jinx myself, but I'm mm -hmm. optimistic that we're going to continue that trend, getting back down to 
you know, three to two cases um, a day. Um, but it, it's really, it's just about, you know, just watch. Right now, it's just about reducing your exposure because, um, you know, every one of these cases, it's, it's the last person I thought that would have transmitted it to me. And, um, but that's just, you know, the nature of this virus. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, we've had, um, in my extended family, we've seen it and it's come in from, it's healthcare workers that have been exposed that are asymptomatic. Um, hockey is, <laughs> you know, I think I, I put out players from six different teams last week alone. And that's, that's one of the reasons why our cases, our case count was a little higher last week was hockey played a, you know, hockey, college students being home. And then it was, there were a lot of college kids that, again, they were, you know, college was closed. So they, they took the opportunity to, to get together with each other. And um, um, so we saw um, several cases come out of that. And, and again, it's, you know, people, people going out together without face coverings and one of the people in the car. Um, I think we had three or four of those where someone in the car had it. They, they drove around to a couple of parties, they went shopping and, um, and then it was one person got it and then two people in another household got it. And um, so it's just, if we're, if we're avoiding those situations, you know, yep. we'll, we'll obviously see better outcomes. Mm -hmm. So Sean, I wanted to ask you, now that we've seen some of the vaccine being distributed, and I know it's early days, but uh, do, is there an expectation that the number of positive tests will start to drop based on the number of vaccines that are administrated over time? Yeah, we, we, ex we expect to see, uh, you know, obviously, um, you know, as the number of uh, vaccinations increase, um, it'll be harder and harder to transmit the virus. Um, it's, there's gonna be, It'll be a, a more of a significant change once we get that second dose. Uh, so I believe, you know, I was re most of us in the community are going to get the Moderna. Um, and what I was reading last night was I believe we get a 52% protection from the first shot, um, and then it goes up to 90, 94, 96% after the second. So it, it's going to take time, but you know, it's, you know, we're getting there. And, you know, just the, the fact that we got the first responders done um, and, and got them done in two days. <laughs> Five communities, you know, 430 odd, um, you know, first responders um, vaccinated in um, two days, I think six total hours. It, it was, you know, it was fantastic. We put it together, you know, we got the word, it just so happened that the word came out when, you know, I think four or five of the regional fire chiefs were together. Mm -hmm. They said, you know, we all convened, put together the application to the DPH. Westboro um, had um, the greatest number of resources that they could put towards it. And they put together a fantastic program and, um, yeah, it, it was it was a model to you know. Mm. So you model. mentioned you mentioned the percentages about fifty two going up to 96 percent, and you didn't mention this one, but I had heard this. I want to know if I just heard something erroneous or if you had heard this too. I'd heard that it was ninety four ninety six percent effective and one hundred percent effective against a severe um, yeah. case for, yeah. of the disease. Right, and one of the things that they're still looking at is, can we, can we get it, but um, asymptomatically, um, and that that's one of the things that they're they're looking at. And then you know this is one of the things that we've been discussing is, um, is you know, once we start getting, um, or once we're vaccinating more and more people. Um, people will be able to log in, you know, using their, you know, they'll be able to text message whether or not they have symptoms. And, you know, our, 
of this process will actually become, you know, data that'll be used to assess, again, how effective everything has been to test different, you know, future hypotheses. And, um, and really, like, this is a model that we'll use, um, you know, in the future for, um, for addressing a pandemic. Um, and then figuring out how to better, um, how to better distribute, you know, in the event that we have to, kind of like the flu, come up with a, a slightly different vaccine next year, you know, how do we, how do we produce it? How do we, um, how do we vaccinate the public? So there, there's a lot of good coming out, a lot of good research coming out of just this vaccination process. Mm. Um, so Sean, it, back part of my original question will individuals that have received the vaccine still be tested for COVID-19 even though they're asymptomatic yes yeah. so and that'll just, give you a basis of whether it's working or not yes so you know that's one of the things that the DPH stressed in Tuesday's call was if you're traveling you're still subject to the travel order. If you've had a contact with a known positive and you've been vaccinated, we're still gonna recommend that, we're still gonna require that you get tested. Um, and then they're trying to figure out now uh, what they have to do or whether or not they're gonna, um, I guess, tweak the quarantine or isolation guidelines. But, um, because again, there's still, you know, we're 10 months into this um, and there's still things to be learned. But um, the expectation is that, yeah, we're, we're still gonna be testing people because that there's a lot of valuable data there. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we're still gonna have to, you know, practice distancing and wear face coverings. But um, I think, you know, the anxiety level in the community will start decreasing and um, yeah. And, um, and then we'll just be in a, in a better place. So if someone's in another state and they get the vaccine and they come to Massachusetts, is there a requirement for quarantining or additional tests by Massachusetts to confirm that? Yes, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's what we were told on Tuesday, so. Um, so kind of, kind of hinting around that is, uh, is a, uh, a thought that I've been having, you know, we are not one of those states that have been denying, um, you know, the effectiveness of masks and uh, and lowering population density and all that kind of stuff. I'm wondering, does it does it cross your mind? Is it a, a kind of a worry in the back of your mind that as people get vaccinated, they're going to be super excited that they are now immune and they'll just be running around and spreading it still, even though they can't get it? Yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I know firsthand there was, you know, someone that I, I know that had got um, they just received their first vaccine. They're getting the second one, and and they have a trip. Um, and they they have a trip plan. And I the first thing I said was, "Have you checked in with, you know, the island? Because I suspect they're still going to require that you quarantine." And they just looked at me, and I said, "Trent, no, oh, I have I, I have a friend that lives there, and I I know that they have actually arrested." They had arrested several Bostonians for uh, illegally mm -hmm. using the beach um, when they were supposed to be in quarantine, and um, and you know, so yeah, I, I think some people are going to be shocked that there are these that, that there are still travel restrictions, and then you know, one of the other things that we need to be aware of is, you know, there are these other viruses that are variants, you know the the African variant, um, you know, they're they're starting to do a lot of research on that, and we wanna we wanna make sure that we're not bringing in, um, mm. you know, these these other, you know, variants into the U.S. We're not bringing it, them in in mass. So I think, you know, people, this is a good time. 
if you're going to start vacationing, focus on local and then working your way out as more and more people get vaccinated. Yeah, that's one of the things you know, I've talked to a few people and they're, they're actually nervous about that because they're saying, well, you know, the vaccine is coming, but not everyone's going to be vaccinated and, you know, it could still be around. And, and I've just been like, I know, I know my department head, as he says, I just want to live. I just want to live. And whenever I'm able at whatever point to get the vaccine, you know, the, the only thing that's really going to take away from me is a lot of fear of having a terrible case of that COVID that could kill me, you know, right. still happy to wear the mask, still happy to do the sanitation and staying away from people until we reach a point that it's okay to do that. Which by the way, what is that point? Um, we, they keep on changing the herd immunity number. Mm -hmm. um, it's one figure I saw was north of 95%. <laughs> you might as well just say 100 at that point. <laughs> it just made me cry. But, um, you know, generally speaking, I think we're going to need to get in that the 80%. And, and it's so, you know, I, I think we're going to we'll still see cases, you know, when people are oh, you know, this is going to be fantastic when you and Casey don't have to handle COVID. And I'm like, you know, that's, that's going to be a couple of years away. You know, we'll, yeah. we'll still be seeing, you know, it trickling in, but um, it won't be in the numbers that um, we're seeing yeah. now. But now that's why we need people to go out and, and, and get vaccinated. And for those that are hesitant, um, don't say no, just say, well, let's see how this plays out with everybody that goes before us. Yeah. So, you know, the first responders, they, they all, they jumped in, they, um, you know, I'm not aware of any adverse effects other than, uh, you know, a sore arm. Um, but the, you know, you get that after a flu shot or a tetanus shot. Um, right. Right. But it's, um, and, you know, in a, it, it's, it's, you know, it's trusting the science. And, and again, if you're, um, you know, it's like, maybe it's like swimming, you know, you test the pool before you jump right in. And yeah. there are those that just jump right in. Um, All right. So let me ask one question, then uh, I'm going to let Bob jump in here. Um, you hear all kinds of stories about people you know, like these percentages of, well, these people, this number of people are not going to get it. Um, and that's a problem. And we have to convince them more. What's your gut sense or what data have you seen for locally and for around our state? Um, what we're hoping for, for percentages for people signing up, you know, quickly and getting it, and not refusing it. Well, I mean, the, the state, the, the, the state is actually, that's one of their main focuses right now is they've got a, 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 a a number of marketing teams working on, you know, communicating um, the the safety of the vaccine, working on um, targeting different populations. Um, be it, you know, it's you know, it's they they've really they're not sparing any money in getting that word out because we we all rec realize that we need to get you know, people vaccinated in order to get control of this. Um, I, I, I give, again, I believe we're shooting for, you know, in a perfect world, the high 80s, um, if not, you know, the 90%, but, um, you know, it, it, and then we think that generally speaking, we, we, we have a good history with people getting the flu vaccine. Um, I have heard talk about, you know, whether or not to make it um, mandatory, but generally speaking, um, that has just been some talk or some chatter and that, um, you know, right to date, this is all voluntary. And, um, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's just imperative to, you know, to look at your neighbor and say, you know, you know, I, I want to do what's best for myself, my family, and you know my neighbor's family, and all the people that I work with. Um, so, 
Well, Sean, I suspect that the longer the vaccinations go on and the more people that get vaccinated, the stronger the belief will be that there's not a negative effect to getting right. the vaccine. Hopefully that's how long, uh, how it works. Did the state or does the state have a time frame when they expect to meet their 80% if that's their goal for uh, indoctrination and for yes, getting the vaccine? We're, you know, our target is to get, um, you know, to hit that, hit that 80, you know, percent you know, that, that, you know, we'll say the, in the eighties um, around June, July. And a lot of that's dependent on, you know, the vaccine being available um, and then us, you know, managing the, the vaccination process. The one good thing about Massachusetts is we have a really strong vaccine, uh, vaccination program and distribution program. So, you know, if KC wants flu vaccine, KC, you know, calls a number, um, they, they, they verify our credentials. And then within a couple of days, you know, there's a shipment coming out to us. So um, there's a well-established courier service um, distribution process and a series, uh, a, a series of checks and balances to get it to us. And then on the flip side, they just rolled out this new system called PrepMod, which will allow us to schedule. So we'll schedule the event, uh, we'll send out links, people will enter in their data um, into, the, um, into the scheduling software that gets rolled into your vaccine, um, uh, your digital vaccine history that's you know shared with your physician and et cetera. So it's a it's a really nice streamlined system. And um, you know, people like me who uh, you know, people like me, I'll be entering in, you know, your lot number. So I'll be able to trace, you know, the lot of vaccine that you get um, um, uh, vaccinated with. Um, and you know, obviously it'll be the date, the time, um, and then that system will then remind you that, you know, and, you know, be it whatever vaccine you get, you know, the 21 days, the 28 days that, you know, you're, you're scheduled for another, um, for your booster shot. And it'll remind you and prompt you to go uh, um, to, you know, you, you know, your health department or the fire department or wherever you got your shot to get that booster. So. It's a, it's a nice system. And, um, you know, we, uh, and to Casey's credit, you know, we have our, we have our emergency dispensing site plan. We have different scenarios for mobilizing the vaccination station, be it outside um, in, you know, in different buildings. We have, we got approval to operate our own system with the prep mod, um, they, uh, you know, we got notification today that we're approved and really it's just us now waiting for the DPH to say, you know, Hopkinton, what is, what do you want to do or what's your throughput based on these parameters we're giving you? And then we will give them um, what we believe we can dispense um, with our workforce and, um, and then we'll just, we'll get into a, uh, you know, just a system where they're delivering vaccine, where um, we're dispensing it. And, and then if we want, you know, if we want to go and tackle the entire school, um, we'll, you know, maybe we'll up the, uh, the, the amount of vaccine we've requested. And then if we're going to go tackle a larger population, you know, we'll be able to stage all of that, but it, it's, here we have a well-developed system. You know, we're not going to do anything like you've seen on TV where they've allotted 750 vials of vaccine and 7,000 people um, or 17,000 people show up to get vaccinated and well, people are waiting three to four hours. You know, you could ask any of the first responders. I don't think they waited more uh, 
more than five or 10 minutes in line. And I'd say the longest part of the process was on the back end where you've got to wait for 15 minutes just to make sure you're not going to experience a uh, reaction. Will all that be coordinated with any other providers? I know, for example, CVS is uh, going to start rolling out some vaccines. So what's going to prevent people from signing up at four different locations to get a vaccine and then tying up the vaccines while they decide which one they want to go to or deciding, well, I went to Casey for my first one, but I'm going to go to CVS for my second one. I don't know that the system allows you to do that because the system knows who has, yeah, I don't believe the system allows, that's, that's I think one of the beauties of this system is that it doesn't allow you to do that because it knows um, who you are um, and it, I don't believe it allow you to set up a duplicate um, vaccin vaccination. Um, but that said, you know, one of the things that the, you know, the governor's, you know, task force is working on is, you know, so the health department will be doing some of the work, CVS will be doing some of the work, um, the physician's offices will be doing some, we should have a, um, a mass vaccination site within 10 minutes of here. I'm just, they haven't confirmed it. I know that they they inspected the facility. Um, it's got the parking they need. It's got the um, the. It, it won't require really any traffic details. Um, it, it's so I I have high hopes that uh, we're going to have a, a a another. We'll have that option available to us. And um, yeah, and and like I said, I've got I've got hope, I've got much higher hopes as a mass resident than I would maybe if I lived outside of Massachusetts. So huh. you suspect that'll be another scenario similar to what happened at the senior center with drive-through vaccine? Yeah, yeah. I mean that's what we like. We demonstrated to the state that we could operate a successful um, uh, mobile vaccine, you know, vaccination program. But you know when we did the last flu vaccine um, delivery we did, uh, it, 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 it was cold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and then when, you know, when we started, you know, just, you know, if we get a big enough space and our, you know, our, we, we schedule our vaccine, you know, our vaccinations at the right, you know, center, you know, five minute centers, we could use some of these facilities and and not um, not you know exceed the uh, distancing requirements in the buildings, and so we're trying to figure out how we can work, you know, within different um, different areas. You know, we have a model for the middle school. That's the standard model. Um, we have a model for the center school. We have a model for the senior center. And we're looking at what other um, models we can put together so that we can best, you know, it might be that we do something down, um, you know, the chief and I were discussing, you know, maybe doing something down on South Street. But so it, it, what we're looking for is an open building um, or a building large enough to safely manage the process. Parking is the big thing. And, um, and then, you know, we want to make sure that we're taking care of, you know, the people that are delivering the vaccines. So. And, and the individuals that receive the vaccine, are they still, even if it's a drive-through scenario, required to pull over and park for 15 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever is required before yeah. they're allowed to drive away? Or is it uh, kind of a honor system that go park over there for 15 minutes when you feel okay, go ahead and leave? Or does someone have to come along and check you out? We prefer to have, we prefer to have control over that, because again, this is a new vaccine, um, yeah. and you know what, what they did in Westboro was, you know, 
the first responders got their vaccine card. They had their attestation that they didn't have COVID um, and that they um, tolerated vaccines well. And then they had an orange card. And the orange card, they wrote, you know, when you got your vaccine, the uh, vaccinator wrote, you know, it's 1045, you can leave the building at 11 and you could only go one way out of the building and you had to pass, you know, a firefighter who was asking for that orange card. And if you, you know, if you were trying to leave um, ahead of schedule, they asked that you sit down and, and they had a physician in the room with EpiPens and, you know, basically they had two ambulances parked outside just out of an abundance of caution. And, uh, but, you know, it, we didn't have to use any of that. It was, it was again, it was a good process. Mm. All right. So let's go ahead, Sean, and let's talk about some of the, the questions that you've been getting. And we have a graphic uh, or two here yeah. that uh, you provided that we should go with. So you tell me what's everybody asking you and what would you like them to see? Everybody wants to know when they're going to get vaccinated. You know, and that's the, you know, and Casey and I will joke, we'd like to know when we're going to get vaccinated because, you know, this is the, you know, right now you have all of these different interest groups lobbying the governor's tax task force and the vaccine task force about where and why they believe that they should be in this position as opposed to another. So what they have done is they have, they, they are now committed to updating the uh, mass. Um, so there is a mass COVID vaccine page for mass, you know. So if people Google mass COVID vaccine, um, we, uh, you, you can get all of the current information. It's being updated every Tuesday and Thursday. And the first graphic that you have is just the general graphic. It's um, who is in phase one, phase two, and phase three. And most people are familiar with this. Um, but what they, what the vaccine program decided to do is utilize this other um, graphic, which gets, it's a little more detailed, and then it lets you know where we are in the process. And um, in this graphic, you know, you can see that, you know, we are at the arrow with the number two on it, the yellow arrow, arrow. We're in the second week of January. We had just started the first responders. We're several weeks in with the COVID facing healthcare workers, long-term care facilities. Um, their vaccination process has started. Um, the, um, they're starting to work on the congregate care settings, that's the governor announced that today. And then um, we are actively um, gathering, you know, in Hopkinton, we have a number of, um, you know, nurses that provide home care. So what we're looking to, to do is to get all of that information aggregated so that we can direct people to, you know, something that we're doing in Hopkinton there are several facilities that'll be taking um, those um, individuals um, if they choose to go to those locations. And then, you know, the mass vaccine, uh, the mass vaccination stations um, will, uh, will be opened up to those individuals. So we're, that graphic will be updated throughout this process. So people know, generally speaking, where they stand. And if they go, if they dig into that page, it starts breaking down, you know, you know, if you're an audiologist, you're going to, in theory, come after this group. Um, you know, if you're a, an, a, a, um, if you're a, if you're a school nurse that is actively testing people and vaccinating people, you're in the front end or the back end of phase one before the school nurses that don't do that. And they're in the kind of the, the front end of phase two. And it's, it's, it's gonna start, it, 
all of these sections will be updated to break down and inform the public when they can expect um, to be vaccinated. And then the, the challenge right now for us is we're waiting for the DPH to start communicating to us, you know, what groups um, are we to prioritize to start advertising to um, because, you know, our, all of our orders are dependent on that. Um, our staffing is dependent on that. And um, the facility we choose to operate out of is dependent on that. Um, but, you know, as the fire, as Chief Slaman continues to say, you know, we didn't know what we were doing with the first responders two weeks ago, but because, you know, the health departments and the fire departments drill on stuff like this every year, because we have to continually update our EDS plans, um, because someone <laughs> during our, our, our training in November happened to say, you know, we're never going to have to use this, you know, and certainly, you know, sure enough, we had to activate this plan. Um, you know, this is something that we're working with. And now it's just, we're, we're ready to implement and, uh, and start, uh, you know, getting people vaccinated. All right. So let me ask you on this chart here about phase one is this the first iteration of this chart or has it been out for a short while it is it's been one? out for two days two, oh, okay days so so i'm just wondering if you have an idea of when the plan was originally made how we're tracking along are we tracking along with what projected? Is the state a little bit ahead or is it is a little bit behind? Do you know that? The, the communities, communities like Hockington and Westboro, you know, we're, we're, we're I, I'd say we're slightly ahead of schedule. You know, we're ready to do more right now. Um, so, and Mass, my understanding is that Massachusetts is faring better in the delivery of vaccine than most other states because we have a good system in place. Um, and as you know, the governor said, I think today and probably the, the entirety of this week is, you know, he's operating on a two day, you know, he's looking at two days because all of this planning is really dependent on how much vaccine we're provided and then how, you know, you know, how is the mass vaccination site doing? How is the city of Boston doing? So, you know, we're all using the same pool of vaccine. Um, and there are some of us that are ready to ramp up right now, but there are probably some smaller communities that, um, you know, that don't have a full-time health agent, don't have a full-time nurse, have a volunteer fire department that are, you know, that are trying to figure out how they're gonna do this whether or not they can do this, and then are they going to divert people to, um, you know, out in Western Mass? You know, the word is that they'll activate the, um, the Big E is going to be activated. UMass Amherst, um, probably one or two of their sport venues will be activated because some of those communities just don't have, you know, the ability um, or the resources to activate a site. Um, but you know, again, for those of us that are in these areas, and you know, our our um, medical reserve corps um, district is very active. Um, you know, they we communicate with them. You know, on a some you know right now on a several times a week. So we're we're always working. We're sharing. You know, I just got a review of every of 10 different first responders um, clinics that were run from communities like um, uh, Arlington, um, Cambridge, um, and then several out here. So, and, you know, we were provided, you know, these best practices, again, to figure out how we can, you know, improve our own, uh, our own service, um, so. Right, now, so um, Hopkinton has gone ahead and has reached a level where they've done their first responders, correct? Correct. So 
does Hopkinton get to move forward to their next level on the list? But we have to wait till everybody, all the first responders are done. Right. right. And this is this is this again, you know, like I'm 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 ready to start planning and ordering and um, but we're just, you know, we're, we're just being told to wait. Yeah. Um, and then um, but you know, we've like I said, we've got a, an active group of volunteers. We have we have medical professionals out there that are contacting us, you know, weekly, saying, you know, if you need help, you know, I'm a I'm a research pediatrician. I'm a um, I'm a, a retired nurse. So it, it looks like you know we will have um, a great number of uh, professionals to draw from to. Um, to assist us, um, and uh, yeah, and like I said, we're just we're ready to activate the plan. So, have you been uh, talking and working with Lisa Jackson? Yes, yes. And she just happens to manage um, an MRC or a Medical Reserve Corps, you know, in the northeast of the state. So mm -hmm. she she works with us. Um, you know, we, we share best practices. We, we talk about just, you know, you know, she, she was helpful in us um, getting the, um, the COVID testing program together because she, she was able to direct us to resources. She had people that she needed to train. So she was able to bring them to us so that they could get their training hours in and, um, so yeah, we um, we work with her. We've been approached um, by representatives from Region Two, um, but um, but you know, I, locally, you know, between you know our health departments and our fire departments, we you know we we believe we have a, a good system together. Uh -huh. And I mean, this year alone, we vaccinated um what. We vaccinated over 400, 400 and change. Normally, you know, on a normal year, we're vaccinating, like we're providing flu vaccine to about 100 in, individuals in town. And we did all of our flu vaccination mobily this year, just to demonstrate that we could do it. And, um, and you know, in each clinic, we had a, um, a we had at least, a representative from the health department, the fire department, and um, and then let uh, one or two volunteers um, participating, so that everybody was getting experience in the, the process. Mm. Um, what about you don't the want me vaccinating anybody? <laughs> 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 I'll take care of the paperwork. <laughs> Speaking of paperwork, um, what kind of costs are associated? I know the the CARES Act um, expired, oh, but what? what? The vaccine, the vaccination is all being handled by the uh, the federal government. The only thing, so when we ask for your insurance information, it's it a it ties you you know it's it's part of your digital. Um, so it it, it it's it's another tie to your digital medical history, but the only thing that the insurance company is paying for is the um, administration fee. So it's the fee to, um, that covers the, the, the time for the, the volunteers or the staff that are administrating the uh, vaccine. So it's, um, I think the insurance companies pay roughly 20, 27 to 29 bucks per person. Okay. Uh, but everything else is being, uh, and then that that's being covered. You know, there's no out of pocket charges for, uh, um, for uh, the residents. I see. Now you mentioned that typically the town vaccinates about a hundred people. Is that correct? For the flu? Yeah. You know how many, what percentage of Hopkinton typically gets the flu vaccine in a regular year in actually versus this year? 
<laughs> but it's 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 normally like normally as a community we we have a large number of residents that are getting vaccinated um, yeah it's just we don't have a large percentage getting vaccinated by the health department right like this year um you know so normally uh, normally it's like 0. 0.005 or six percent that get vaccinated um but this year uh, we're about two percent um we, you know, we so we vaccinated about 400 out of seventeen thousand five hundred or so okay and is, is there is there a cost to the residents for that who get who go through and get no, that it's all covered by your insurance oh okay and then and, and, and this is the uh um, you know, and, and this is one of the interesting things is that by operating a clinic, um, we do get, so the health department gets um, reimbursement for some of that work. So that's the other thing is that, you know, historically, you know, we were, um, we were letting outside vendors come in to provide, um, and, and there were, there are many outside vendors willing to come into Hopkinton mm -hmm. to provide the vaccination services because they were collecting, you know, 20 to 30 bucks off of every vaccine. Um, and, you know, what we're trying to do is keep that, you know, that money in the town um, to help, you know, it's to help offset budgets, to help just to help, you know, with the, uh, you know, the, the general operation of the health department and the community in general. Right. All right. So Sean, listen, I mean, no, um, uh, I'm just going to say it. We have one minute left, Sean. <laughs> so uh, is there, is there anything that you would like to communicate to the community that we haven't already talked about if they have, you know, like concerning questions or anything else, you got one minute. A trust the process. You know, we have a lot of really good people that have worked to develop the vaccine and and develop the process to get people vaccinated. And, you know, then I just, I ask for everybody's continued cooperation. You know, we've been great. And now it's, we just need to hunker down and, and, and kind of bridge. We want to have a nice clear bridge to get to that time when everybody is vaccinated and the better we are at that the better our outcome is going to be this summer uh i i second that as as my friend was telling me today nobody wants to be the last person to die in world war one just right. before you know just before it ends and we're really close now so um uh, all we I like do taking is... some vacation this summer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't. Maybe after June or July. <laughs> yeah, August will be fine. <laughs> All right, Sean. Thank you for spending this hour with us. Thank you so much for um, disseminating this knowledge and uh, keeping us abreast of everything. No, and I just ask people to take a look at our website or at the town's website because we'll be posting things regularly. Perfect. All right. All right. You can have the rest of the night off. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all for joining us on the Hangout Hour. And we invite you to come back next time, Mondays at 2, Wednesdays at 7, where we're talking about Hopkinton. So take care, everybody. All right. Good night. Good night.